We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. And happy to report that Carlos Suarez is here with us. And hi, Carlos. And, and we're enjoying Global Connections with him. We're going to talk about U.S.-Mexico relations uh, in uncertain times. You know, we catch up on this and other international relations issues with Carlos. And it's always interesting to see how, you know, the U.S. appears on the world stage. So welcome yeah. to the show, Carlos. As well. Welcome, Jay. Always a delight. And, you know, our connections are always there. Um, I, um, I'm excited to share with you again. We often do this. We talk uh, particularly about this complex relationship of the United States with Mexico. Quite often, especially in Hawaii and in the Asia Pacific, it's not quite on the radar, given, you know, just the geographic proximity, even in the mainland U.S. Sometimes Europe or, you know, China become more important. But anybody who knows just from basic, you know, both culture and commerce and trade, Mexico is the big, big uh, U.S. partner. Uh, it's a complex relationship. Uh, it's fair to say that today, U.S.-Mexico relations are at a pretty much an all-time low, kind of like with China, kind of like with our European allies. Uh, Trump has brought in, a, you know, a different style of, of, of leadership and approach and, you know, rather confrontational with Mexico, more focused on the security, the wall, uh, you know, some ugly names that he, you know, he spoke in, 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 his, in his address when he, you know, when he accepted the or when he announced his candidacy, right? Uh, Mexico sends their worst, their rapists, blah, blah, blah. Well, setting that aside, I think it's important for us to understand the relations continue to operate on many levels. So part of it is government to government, you know, president to president, and that's one thing. At another level, especially now, the last 25 years of, of this NAFTA deep interdependence, there's a lot of interconnections that go on at the sort of, I wanna say, you know, the level of, let's say, bureaucrats and business people. And there's always been, of course, a massive, massive connection between flows of labor markets, workers, you know, Im immigrants that go and come, um, as well, just the family connections, you know, a large population. And let me just, before we move ahead, I want to say a few factoids about this, because, of course, Mexicans see it often very different from the view of the U.S. For the U.S., there's this border, this legal boundary, and there's us and there's them. And yet, this region of the southwest U.S., used to be part of Mexico. It's populated by populations that have been there for generations, for centuries. Obviously the larger population are newer arrivals within the last century and, and waves of immigrants that have come. But you know, long before even Anglo-Americans settled into places like Texas, you had communities, you know, El Paso, Santa Fe, San Antonio, they were always Mexican and they are today. They are Mexican majority in so many cases. Um, a, a couple of other quick things. Uh, obviously, uh, we have this 2,000 mile border. Uh, nowhere else in the world do you have two countries that have such a difference in level of development and, and the deep interconnection. Um, and, you know, today Mexicans continue going. However, the flow has slowed down a bit. We don't have the waves that we used to in, in past years in part also because there's a net return migration. Many Mexicans have either, in, you know, uh, for different reasons and choice or circumstance are coming back. So we're not seeing a huge flow, uh, but it does continue and it's more diverse than ever. Today, it includes skilled workers, professionals, students, uh, obviously unskilled workers, no doubt continue. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the pandemic and, and, and what implications that might have because it could go both ways. Uh, we could see Mexico suffer and, and, you know, have more waves coming, but we also have other circumstances that have made it more difficult. Um, but obviously, Mexico and the U.S. share this complex relationship. Um, what, what I want to show with you briefly is, uh, you know, uh, the relationship always complex, always multi-levels going on. So, you know, many things, kind of like you might see with China as well, complex relations, you know, trade, human rights, you know, law enforcement, da da da. Um, under the more recent Trump administration, I mentioned we've had, of course, a more confrontational approach, but it's also been a change in that we have, in some ways, policy done more by executive decree. Uh, Donald Trump has not been able to get a lot of immigration policy changes done through the Congress, through laws. And so it's more in the form of executive actions that he's you know, constantly signing. Uh, there's a very interesting report I wanna share. I'll just show the title of it here. If I can get a quick look at it, we have a picture. Uh, a recent report published uh, some months ago by the Migration Policy Institute, one of the leading sort of think tanks. Um, and this is a, a report called Dismantling and Reconstructing the U.S. Immigration System, a Catalog of Changes Under Pre Trump Presidency. And what it addresses and what it looks to is, you know, what are the various ways in which, you know, different changes that have been reshaping U.S. immigration policy 
since his arrival, you know, January 2017. But let me just put it in the context too. The United States has not had any substantial, or maybe let me rephrase it, has not had a comprehensive immigration reform since the mid 80s. You might remember Jay long ago, there was a immigration reform and control act uh, under President Reagan. It got negotiated, it went through a lot of debate and discussion in the Congress. It provided an amnesty for a large population that, that was there. Uh, it also set up sort of worker sanctions that were very easy to violate, but the idea was that you're supposed to show IDs, et cetera, but you know, that was weak. But my real point is that we have not had any immigration reform since then. There have been a few piecemeal actions here and there. In the year 2000, we had a window of opportunity. Uh, George W. Bush was the new president in the U.S., governor of Texas. You know, he has a brother married to a Mexican. He knows Mexico. Uh, Vicente Fox is elected president in Mexico, very pro-business governor. They began a dialogue to have a, a potential guest worker program, legal process. Well, 9-11 happens and guess what? Uh, here we are almost 20 years later. Good luck with any immigration reform or consensus. You look today in 2020, we don't have a tradition of bipartisanship. Immigration is a hot item. We've got, you know, polarized society. So it's probably unrealistic to expect a comprehensive immigration bill, even if Biden wins and has a majority in the Congress. It's a very dicey issue. Um, having said all that, I mean, again, I think right now we're still going to have to continue figuring out what's going to happen with the outcome of the election, because it could go different ways. If we have a a re-election of President Trump, one possible scenario, that we would probably see more continuity of this using executive actions and rather, you know, I guess you could say hard line positions uh, in general, you know, toughening the border, restricting uh, access, limiting visas, on and on. If there's a Biden victory, again, uh, we can only speculate, uh, it really depends on what control of the Congress happens and whether that will allow a reform. But I go back to this idea the days of bipartisan immigration reform, probably challenging. I mean, I can't predict it with certainty, but uh, I think even in a post-Trump world, it's gonna be challenging to have consensus on that. Let me stop for that and maybe I'll let you to tease out a few things and I'll, I'll come back to continue expanding on this. But what I'm suggesting here is that US-Mexico relations, very important and complex, but it's gonna take a lot of time to figure out how to deal with this immigration issue because it's got so many pieces of the puzzle. You know, the, uh, the immigrants in the U.S., whether to provide amnesty, the whole challenge of migrants that are coming from Central America, the caravans that we've talked about at times, uh, and add to that the pandemic and what are the implications of that. So uh, a, a challenging issue uh, for U.S. and Mexico. Yeah. Well, you talk about immigration uh, through the caravans and, uh, of, you know, Mexican people trying to get into the U.S., and, and most of those are, are Central American. Remember, those caravans are from Central right, America, across coming Mexico, through right. Mexico. And exactly. Mexico, by agreement, stopping them at the border or sending yeah, them back. And yeah. It's complex and it's mean and nasty, like separating families. Mm -hmm. Mean and nasty. <clears throat> but what, you know, what's an interesting possibility is this. There are people here in Hawaii and elsewhere on the mainland who uh, are very concerned about a continuation of the Trump administration. <clears throat> because it's mean and nasty, not only in terms of immigration in, but in terms of domestic policy and domestic, you know, civil rights. Um, uh, gee whiz, there's so many things that have happened that are so devastating and threatening, including, of course, his, his non-policy on COVID and his policy on health care. Oh, my goodness. There are people here, I'm sure you know some, uh, who would like to leave the United States if he's reelected. In fact, some of them want to leave right now. And so you, you know, hear about people lining up at the um, American consulates in Canada trying to get uh, Canadian papers, uh, and for that matter, in Asia. I, I think it's harder in Europe, but there are people who want to get out of town. <clears throat> they don't see a future here. And uh, I mean, I understand them. <clears throat> the question is, and we've always had retirees who leave the United States go to Mexico. They're, they're, I, I, you know more, but I think they're all over Mexico because it's, it's about one there. million, one million U.S. One residents. Million people, yeah. Many retirees. I expect that there'll be a lot more lining up on the Mexican border to try to, you know, get papers to live in Mexico and find, um, find a better home. 
And although, you know, Mexico has, uh, you know, economic problems, it has violence with the gangs and all that and the drugs. Fact is that, um, you know, voting is universal. I, I really like that idea. Uh, I like the idea that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, AMLO uh, is in for six years. I know if he's bad, that's too long. If he's good, that's too short. <laughs> but, <clears throat> and, you know, there's a lot of liberal things about Mexico. You can have a nice life in Mexico. You're in Mexico right now, I think, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I think there are people who have some familiarity with it who would like to be there. And I just wonder if there is or is going to be an onslaught of American applications uh, for, uh, for citizenship or permanent residence in Mexico. What do you see, Carlos? Um, I, I'm not sure I, I would say a lot. I mean, the appeal for some is that you can have a quality of life uh, that's more affordable, that is living in Mexico on a social security pension or a retirement pension, uh, you know, $3,000 a month will go a lot farther than it might in the US where you could be, you know, but having said that, I'm not sure that Mexico has quite the either capacity or appeal because it has its own challenges and they are there. Now, this large community I've mentioned of expats, uh, as they're called in, in Mexico, they're concentrated in certain areas, you know, some of the colonial cities in central Mexico, San Miguel de Allende comes to mind. Uh, and there are a small number of growing retirement communities. It's still not common in Mexico to have what we see in the US, these very you know, well-organized, uh, you know, retirement communities, not so common in Mexico. However, there are a small number happening and Americans are the main clients for some of these. They're sort of Americanizing it. But I don't know, having said all that, I think it's hard to say. I mean, uh, Mexico is not an easy place for those who like it and enjoy it and, and you know, want to have that. But it's a country with its own real serious social challenges and problems, a lot of inequality, a concentration of wealth. So there are, there are some tough issues. Now, again, it doesn't stop a million Americans from living there. In fact, it's part of the appeal that it is a different quality of life, a different pace. Um, but my first thought, again, I'm just thinking out loud. I, I don't know that it's going to be the host of a lot of political refugees. I think Canada is more appealing for quality of life and even being able to, if you're, especially if you're working. Here, I would just go back to this. The Mexico appeals more to the retiring American who doesn't have to work and doesn't have to worry about that and already knows Mexico or got connected somehow. So they now say, hey, I can go there and do this. Beyond that, I'm not going to see it as a place that's going to suddenly appeal to people who don't have a connection and work opportunities are going to be challenging for an American who wants to work there. Uh, anyhow, let me leave it at that for now. But uh, yeah, we are living in uncertain times, of course. Um, I think the interesting thing, and maybe just to bring it back to the US-Mexico relationship is, this is not unique to the US and Mexico, but in a lot of places, you are having people who traditionally would come to the US and stay there, immigrants, um, increasingly are finding a reverse brain drain. Uh, uh, years ago, you might remember, who was this guy, a local guy that uh, you know had written a book about this uh, God, what was his name? I can't remember if he was with the Campbell Estate or he was some, uh, he was an academic connected with UH. Anyhow, his book was about the reverse brain drain where traditionally, you know, Mexico would send its best and brightest and they would become engineers and bankers in the US and that still happens. But increasingly skilled, you know, workers who are coming back and they could be even, you know, a, you know lower income, but they've got skills. In other words, this return migration. Some of them are professionals uh, and they might be coming to Mexico because now they have all the comforts of the first world here, the same in India, the same in you know other parts of the developing world where mobility and technologies allow us to do that more. So again, maybe I could see some finding a little patch of a uh, piece of you know beach in Southern Mexico or someplace. The challenge I would go back to this, having lived in Mexico some years now is that you need to get good connection to the internet and that's not universal in Mexico. It is in the big urban centers, but in some of the remote areas, you know, unless you're prepared to live as a recluse in a little cabin, you need good internet access. You've got to be in the urban centers. So mm. that's, that's what it is. <clears throat> Don't rule out the possibility that some creative investors and entrepreneurs will create senior facilities, senior, you know, communities, sure. including uh, broadband. Uh, yes, of course. No, you have life to. for anybody who lives there and will encourage yes. Americans to come. Is it hard to get papers? Well, um, you know, in general, it's not hard to come and many Americans do it if you go back and forth. Now, today, that's 
constrained. You know, they, they, the border is closed, although not realistically, but it has been slowed down. But what I'm getting at there is that you can go and live in Mexico for some time without having to worry about a permanent residency visa. Uh, I think up to six months, I'm, I may be guessing there, but, but it, it, it's not like often people from other countries might travel and have like 90 days or more restricted uh, mm -hmm. tourist visa. Um, what is more difficult is the work visa, of course, and even like permanent residency. There is a process and you go through it and, and you know, you have to learn it, but it's there. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it is uh, nevertheless, uh, Mexico does accommodate, again, a lot of foreign nationals. Americans are the number one. There's large communities of Europeans and South Americans that, that are also immigrants. And let me just say this again, curiously, like the United States, uh, Mexico is one of these countries that is every aspect of the migration. It is a sending country, migrants leave Mexico. It is a receiving country, they come from everywhere. It's a transit country, uh, the Central Americans, but also Caribbean and even African immigrants coming through Mexico to get their way, even from China, you know, showing up in Tijuana and then crossing the border that way. Uh, so it's, again, it, it, it has all of these complexities. It's also a destination place, again, for Central Americans, and Americans that we've just described, these expats that are coming, you know, retirees uh -huh, uh -huh. in particular. Well, let me let me ask you this. Um, so we, we had a show last week where we we had actually uh, one 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 of our guests on from Kobe, Japan, another one from Paris at the same time. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and we compared notes on how the people in those places felt about the election. You know, because the fact is that when Trump gets on, like you know, debate tonight. Uh, coming soon, actually. Yes. yes. Um, uh, you know, the whole world watches yes. MSNBC, CNN, for that matter, Fox News, the whole world watches. And I am really wondering, you say, you know, relations are at a low point, and I'm sure AMLO is watching because he, he wants to, um, he should want to understand his options with Biden if Biden wins. So the question is, as I asked Kobe in Paris, um, you know, how do people feel? They, they're just as familiar in many ways as the average American is with what's going on in Washington and with Trump. Do they like him? Do they not like him? Do they, are they hoping, wishing, praying uh, for, for a Biden landslide? Uh, yeah. And how does AMLO feel about that, if you know? Yeah, well, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, AMLO is not likely to watch it. He doesn't have a keen interest in, he, he knows he doesn't know English, which is the first Mexican president in literally a generation since the 80s. Um, he's not very interested in diplomacy and global affairs. He will get a briefing from his foreign minister and, and obviously you know his advisors uh, who will be watching it intently. And the foreign minister, uh, obviously uh, that's his role as a diplomat. Uh, and I just mentioned that about the Mexican president because he's kind of just, you know, he's just, that's not his thing. Uh, but having said that, in the Mexican population, there's certainly a lot of interest, no doubt. Um, there, there is, especially among the more educated elite, I mean, very keen to see what the implications are going to be. The overall stereotype impressions, well, Trump is, you know, he's not well liked in general. Um, overall, many are critical because he has been very critical of Mexico, no doubt. Um, there is a small minority who actually see that maybe, you know, Trump could be beneficial for Mexico by pressuring the Mexican government by obviously, you know, the sort of more law and order types or the sort of, you know, big billionaire investor type. But I would say that on the whole, the, you know, consensus and the majority is like they would prefer the Trump, you know, go away and, 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 and move on because it has been very adversarial. And, and most notably last year in the summer, you had a very big crisis where you had these caravans coming through Mexico and Donald Trump using his threat of the tariff wars. You remember he was throwing tariffs everywhere. He basically pressured the Mexican government to accept uh, a tougher position. They had to de redeploy or to deploy a newly created National Guard to the southern border to kind of stop the flow. And if they did not, literally the US was providing a specific threat that they would increase tariffs, you know, I think, you know, 5% every month for the next, unless they showed indicator. So it was playing, it was also very rare, the first time that immigration and migration control was connected to trade policy. In other words, you do this or else we will put the squeeze on you with an increase in tariffs, taxes on, on, on your goods. And in the end, the Mexican government, the President AMLO had to agree, uh, this is part of the asymmetrical relationship between Mexico and the US. The US is a bully and a superpower and it more or less 
calls the shots. It gets what it wants. Um, for the Mexican president, it was awkward. He had to, you know, sort of do it, but also in a way to kind of frame it so he could sell it to the domestic audience. Not an easy task. Um, so back to the election. Yeah, there's a lot of keen awareness. People are interested in it. Um, as you know, I have students, I teach both in the U.S. and in Mexico. The Mexican students I have, of course, these are, you know, they're more uh, educated, more elite, uh, but they're keenly aware of it. I would actually tell you they know more about our system than most Americans do, uh, even the intricacies of the Electoral College and, you know, the swing state. But, um, you know, there's a lot at stake. And, 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 you know, more practically for, let's say, young generation like my students, I mean, the option of coming to study in the U.S. Right now, it's, a, it's very uncertain. It's difficult. Even if you get a, a, an award, uh, you know, can you get a visa? Everything's been kind of on hold. Um, I think as a result of that, the young population is increasingly looking to Canada and to Europe and to other places to build connections and, you know, go study abroad, do a master's degree in Australia instead of Mexico, or the U.S. or Canada. Um, and that is definitely a reflected as well. But look, having said that, at the end of the day, the United States will always be the most important player for Mexico and Mexicans have to accept that too. It, it's uh -huh. the main economic partner. It's well, this is a low point in relations. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that's a serious characterization. Um, it must have effect on the Mexican economy and uh, for that matter, the oil industry uh, and other related, you know, economic phenomena. So query, you know, how, how is the Mexican economy doing in the face of this low point in relations, uh, especially around the oil economy? Yeah, um, well, I would say that while the relations are low, it has more to do with the relationship, the personal ties between the leaders and the draconian immigration policies. The economy, I mean, you know, it's a mixed bag, but in general, the U.S. has a vested interest in Mexico having a stable and prosperous economy. And for example, with the pandemic, the U.S. put a lot of pressure on Mexico to keep the factories churning, you know, those automobile parts and the assembly of automobiles, et cetera. Um, so, and yet having said that, like every place on the world, Mexico is certainly suffering, you know, from the pandemic, the, the clampdown, uh, more than half the population is in the informal economy and they, you know, they are suffering as well. Um, but let me just clarify this, that the, the low point in U.S.-Mexico relations is not like it's punishing or making Mexico suffer more necessarily economically, because there's a deep level in, of interdependence. And this is why I would say beyond the relations between the leaders, there's a lot going on between basically the in the economy between you know economic sectors, uh, a lot of foreign investment from the U.S. in Mexico and vice versa. Mind you, Mexican Americans are not aware, but there's huge Mexican investments that are growing in the U.S. Uh, in different sectors. You know, from food stuff to you know cement and 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 parts. Uh, a lot of large Mexican companies are now penetrating the U.S. market increasingly. Um, so, I mean, the economy is big, it's complex, and uh, it's mostly the automobile sector that is interconnected. So again, I go back to the United States wants to make sure Mexico doesn't flounder because it will affect the U.S. as well if it cannot produce, you know, yeah. and, and, and you know, continue. What about Mexican uh, entrepreneurship and creativity? You know, adversity uh, is an opportunity. Uh, sometimes it's painful, but it's an opportunity. And I really wonder whether the wall and this whole, you know, thing that Trump has built to, to keep Mexico out actually creates a, a beneficial environment for entrepreneurs and for creative development and business. I was, you know, just joking and thinking right now, you know, when, when you build a wall, well, it's Mexicans that are going to build it to begin with, but also Mexican companies, specifically, uh, there's a, a massive oligopoly, uh, practically a monopoly, uh, the, uh, a cement company from Mexico, one of the largest in the world. They're the ones who benefit from any construction and walls. But having said that, I guess I would say this, uh, let me just think, uh, um, you know, the labor markets that flow mostly from the US to North, those continue and you know they're just part of it. That's not being stopped. And so the wall, it's more symbolic. And, and it's also, I think from the perspective of Mexico, it's more of an insult because uh, from, I would go back to this, the psyche, the mentality for many of those Mexicans who cross it, it's just an obstacle. It's not gonna stop them. It's gonna slow them down and make them think twice. But in the end, they're simply going with the natural flow of where the jobs are. There's a pull factor. In other words, the jobs in the US are essentially pulling and giving incentives for people to come. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to do it. They're going to do it at all risks and sometimes very dangerous uh, they, or they have to pay smugglers to bring them over in many cases. So it's sure. a dangerous venture, but it's driven by this pull of the United States. It's just it's just historic for many years. Mm -hmm. So a uh, question, big question, Carlos. Um, <clears throat> you know, there is a fair chance and I knock wood when I say that because uh, I, I voted for Biden and I would urge all my friends to do the same. Um, and, um, you know, there's a fair chance he'll, he'll win. Somehow he'll get through, you know, this, this uh, gauntlet that Trump is setting up for him, including tonight at the debate, and he'll become the president. And he's gonna have his hands full fixing all the damage, the horrendous damage that Trump has rendered on this country and for that matter, the world, including Mexico. What would be your advice to Biden on Mexico-US relations? What could he do to straighten things up and, and I don't wanna say return, but create a better, a better international relationship, discussion, engagement um, between the US and Mexico? Well, again, in, in these last few minutes, it's real quick. I mean, part of it is going to be to reverse many of the policies that we've seen, you know, draconian measures to address the DACA, make sure it's clear, uh, essentially to relax uh, and, and go back to, uh, you know, what was the previous administration's policy. Now, obviously, if you're a supporter of the harder line and, you know, the position that Trump has taken, uh, that would be like a sellout or going back. On the other hand, it is a more humanitarian and, you know, and rational approach. Beyond that, I would say what, what, what you're likely to need to do in rebuilding trust and relationship, you have to engage, you have to be present in, in that case in Mexico, there has to be uh, even building the personal relations. So ultimately, Joe Biden will need to come to Mexico. I mean, this has been a tradition for decades where one of the first places you visit is the other. It doesn't have to even be Mexico City. They could meet at the border, they could meet at some ranch, they could meet, you know, whatever. Uh, they'll do that often. Uh, Obviously, the more formal part would be hosting a, you know, a state dinner. Uh, frankly, I don't know that AMLO is likely to do it, but he would be smart if he invited Biden to come and hosted him for a visit. And da -da -da. What I'm getting at here is that leaders do have to develop personal relations, and that goes a long way. Uh, Trump never came to Mexico as a president. He did come, however, in 2015 as a candidate, and it was a very controversial visit. The then president, the, the predecessor, Peña Nieto, invited him. Uh, and he came and he gave him almost like a, a reception that was like a head of state. You know, they had a big press conference and many here were critical of Peña Nieto. It's like, wait a minute, he's just a candidate. He's not the president because Hillary Clinton didn't come. I, I, I can't recall if she was even invited, but the point is that Trump comes as a candidate, but he has not come as a president. Uh, AMLO finally went this past July, a few months back in the summer, and went to the White House, signed the, the revised NAFTA, the USMCA agreement. Um, and yet many critical of that saying, well, now he's best friends with Trump. What's gonna happen with Biden? Is it gonna be complicated? Well, at the end of the day, I don't think so. I mean, look, any president has to work with your neighbor. And I would hope that if there is a move to our Biden presidency, it would simply reopen this tradition of, hey, let's meet, you know, even if it's just at the border or, you know, maybe, you know, AMLO, AMLO can go to San Antonio, Texas, and we can have a meeting there and, you know, talk story. Because in diplomacy and in bilateral relations, you need to develop those ties, you know, to, to, to foster, you know, I guess a breakthrough. Uh, and I think that would go a long way. Other than that, obviously, just a whole change in the policy back to, you know, what had been before, will go a long way to open more cooperation and coordination. Because Again, Mexico and the U.S., there's a lot going on in cooperation over security issues, fighting the, you know, the drug war. Uh, in fact, just this past week, I don't know, Jay, if you saw this, but in the LAX airport, uh, the FBI, uh, Homeland Security, arrested the former defense minister of Mexico, uh, who was there in the six years of the previous government, Peña Nieto. He was arrested basically for corruption and all kinds of charges. That's a big deal. Um, and... Uh, well, no, it's part of an ongoing challenge that Mexico has dealing with corruption at the highest yeah, sure. levels. Uh, well, what about and, uh, beyond returning to the good old days? Uh, but I hate to use that, uh, you know, uh, bring back the good old days, but what about exceeding the good old days? Uh, what about doing better? I mean, ideally, what would you like to see um, in a, a denouement? <laughs> of, of the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico. I mean, if you had a clear slate, um, what would you like to see? 
Well, it's a challenge because it's not only the bilateral relationship. In other words, there, there just needs to be more, you know, mutual respect, appreciation, showcasing context. But what I'm getting at also is that in the United States, because this population of Mexicans is so large and it's such a key fabric of, you know, and again, in Hawaii, we don't always appreciate that. That's but on because the mainland, we don't have enough Mexican restaurants. Uh, be, uh, we, well, and, and the, the population, food. while it's there, it's buried. It's, you know, it's, it's drowned out by the Filipinos, by the, you know, others, even Puerto Rican, you know, local Puerto Ricans that have been there, you know, a century are, are more prominently figured. But that aside, the reality for the mainland of the U.S. is the demographics are happening there. Uh, there are, you know, Mexicans have always been there, but they're coming, they're growing. And even the, the population growth that we've had now is, is natural growth. In other words, there's not huge immigration that's coming. It is the population itself that is expanding. And, you know, let me give you a finish this with a couple of quick factoids. Obviously, we've seen a tremendous growth in the last 30, 40 years. Just some figures here in 1970, the Latino, not just Mexican, Mexicans are two thirds. They're the majority of the Latinos, but they made up only 4.5% in 1970. By the year 2010, 16.3% surpassing African-Americans. By 2020 now, they're expected to be much higher than that, over 20 million. And here's a couple of dramatic points to mention. In the year 2010, 10 years ago, one of every four babies born in the US was born to a Latina mother. 10 years ago, probably a little more now. By 2050, the Latino share of the nation's total population is projected to nearly double. Uh, today, it's 16%, or maybe 10 years ago, it's expected to be 30%. So one in three US residents will be Latino, one in three. Well, what I'm getting at here is that I think you need to also embrace the Latino identity culture that's in the US and use that as a way to harness better relations with Mexico. Um, I guess what I'm getting at there is that, yeah, we have, and, and, and today the polarization and the culture wars, part of it is that many places in the US who see a changing demographic, this reality that's happening, they're not comfortable with it. it, it it's changing the identity of the US. And one of the biggest challenges is that this large population of Mexicans, they do not assimilate as quickly and as easily as other immigrants. They keep mm. their culture, they keep their language. And that can be comforting for some, but ultimately, if you want to succeed and, and, and you know, do well in the U.S., you have to have a good working knowledge of English. You have to be able to assimilate into the larger culture. Yeah. So it presents a challenge. Trump in this election? What's that? I'm sorry? You think they will vote for Trump in this election? Uh, no, overwhelmingly, they will vote for Biden. However, of course, we're talking about Mexicans. Uh, the Latino population, Cubans continue to be still more in favor of Republicans. Things are changing in terms of the younger generation there. But uh, for the most part, uh, Mexican populations, overwhelmingly, not as high as African-Americans, but certainly, you know, 60, 70 percent will, will go for the Democrat candidate in general. Um, the exception being maybe some of the you know, long established communities, uh, you know, Mexicans that again, trace their origin for centuries or many, many generations, uh, they become more assimilated over time, more conservative, you know, ex-military, you know, maybe entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So there's always, it, it's not overwhelming, but it's certainly a pretty significant majority. Um, yeah, certainly part of the melting pot, the diversity yeah. and the success of the nation. And, we, and so Republicans a... have had a challenge and now they've often said, oh, well, they, you know, they have traditional conservative values, anti-abortion. But at the end of the day, they have not succeeded at really garnering a lot of support. So they tend to be primarily Democrat voters. How do they feel about abortion? Again, for those who are deeply religious, Catholic, I mean, they may have a stronger view. Uh, ultimately, like others, uh, most Mexicans and, and those uh, are more secular and maybe that's not as powerful as you might expect it to be. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, thank you, Carlos. This has really been a great discussion and I really appreciate you suggesting it and, and uh, um, helping us understand uh, the relationship between the two countries and the possibilities for the future. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. See you next time soon. Aloha. Aloha. Take care.